Julie, are you ready? Yes. Yep. Okay, so today we have the pleasure to listen to Larry Oksanen, who recently moved to Helsinki. He will speak about uh, space-time finite element methods for control problem subject to the wave equation. And for the audience, please um, turn off your microphone during the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvan. And I would like to thank the organizers for the for the invitation to give this talk. My background is not really in, in, in control theory, although I've been a user of control theory for a long time. <clears throat> and only re very recently, I have uh, really uh, worked with uh, control theory problems. And, and this is uh, very exciting to give this talk now in this control theory uh, seminar. So I'm going to speak about uh, numerical analysis of, uh, of the control problem uh, for the wave equation. And this is based on uh, joint work with uh, Eric Burman, Ali Faiz Mohammadi, and Arnold Munch. Uh, so this is the, the problem that I will, I will focus on. So uh, this is uh, what you often call a distributed control problem for the wave equation. We can also uh, extend these results that I'm going to talk about to the case of boundary control, but uh, that is uh, more technical and the results are less clean. So in this talk, I want to focus on this distributed case. So the problem formulation is, is as follows. So we have some uh, time, amount of time that you use uh, for controlling the equation called capital T. Uh, the equation is posed on a spatial domain called omega. We assume always that it's connected, bounded, open, and the, sp the boundary is smooth. And then there will be a cutoff function called chi that localizes the control to some uh, region, smaller subset of this uh, omega. And I will specify the, the assumptions on the cutoff function a bit later. But uh, the rough formulation of the problem is that we fix an initial state u0, u1, and we want to find a control function phi here on the right hand side of the wave equation localized with this chi such that this control drives the solution to the wave equation to the zero state at time capital T. And this is of course a very classical problem and uh, in a sense perfectly understood in the theoretical level. We know that the problem has solution under the geometric control condition that I will just denote by GCC and this goes uh, back to the famous work of uh, Bardos, Lebo and Rauch. So let me just quickly recall how this uh, uh, condition is formulated. So we say that a, a cylinder uh, in this uh, large space-time cylinder, a smaller cylinder inside this large cylinder, satisfies geometric control condition if every generalized light ray intersects it. So what I mean by this is that, um, well, here is a schematic. So in the schematic, uh, we have time axis is the vertical axis, and this is just like one plus one decays, and then space is the horizontal one. Uh, the, the light rays are just lines that have 45 degree angle with the time axis. So uh, this uh, orange line here, broken line, is a schematic of uh, a generalized light ray. Uh, when it uh, touches the boundary, it reflects according to Snell's law. Um, but then one needs to be a bit careful what, what happens if you have tangential contacts with the boundary. So it can start to glide as well. And, and, and the case of uh, infinite order of contact is even more complicated. But let me not go into this sort, sort of details now. So this is just the, the typical condition in this famous paper. Um, so here in this picture, these black lines stand for uh, the lateral boundary of this large cylinder. So this is the, the set. Uh, this time interval across the boundary of the spatial domain. And this blue region is then the smaller cylinder, A, B across the small base omega. And the idea is that all these broken lines with 45 degree angle must touch the 
uh, blue area. So for instance, the sort of the worst case is something like this. So you have a line here, then it reflects. Oops. Let me try to draw a line like this. And then it again uh, reflects. So we see that in this picture, the, the the condition is satisfied because no matter how you draw this sort of broken line, it will always have to intersect this blue region. Now, the, this, this um, condition then implies what is called the observability estimate, saying that uh, if you look at the solution to the wave equation with some uh, initial data, then the size of the initial data can be bounded by the size of the solution restricted into the blue area. And this is, uh, of course, uh, shown in this in this paper by uh, Bardos, Lebo, and Rauch. Okay. So I'm going to assume this uh, condition throughout the talk in, in this uh, specific form related to this cutoff function. So now the, the, the precise formulation of the control problem that I'm considering is as follows. So the cutoff function uh, depends on both space and time. So is a product of, uh, of cutoff in, in time and, and a cutoff in, in space. This uh, cutoff in space is squared here. Uh, both the space and time cutoff functions are smooth. They take values between 0 and 1. And then there is this technical condition that the cutoff in time must be 0 near the, the initial and, and final times. I will explain a little bit later where this condition comes from. Um, because this is probably not the usual, uh, the most usual one that you have in these problems. And then uh, the geometric control condition is tied to this um, cutoff function by saying that the cutoff function must be one on, an, on a cylinder that satisfies the geometric control condition. And this, uh, this assumption A will be a standing assumption in the, in the whole talk. And then, of course, this assumption implies that the problem has a solution. So here is now just the, the same control problem repeated. And moreover, uh, the geometric control condition actually implies that if uh, you have smooth, compactly supported initial data, you not u one, then there is a smooth control driving the solution to the zero state at, at time capital T. Uh, while the solution is, is not uh, unique, I mean, this control function phi is not unique, uh, but you can then consider some uh, minimal, minimum norms or, uh, controls. So for certain minimal control uh, phi, what we do in this, is in this work, this will be the, the focus of the talk. Uh, we show uh, how to compute a finite element approximation of this control phi, satisfying this type of convergence uh, bound. So in this, uh, when, when you cut this control function with chi, so, so you actually look at this, uh, this important region here actually appearing in the equation, then uh, this discrete approximation that we construct converges to the to this certain minimal norm solution with rate that depends on the mess size of the finite element approximation and on the polynomial order uh, of the approximation in a, in a rather natural fashion. So it's a scale like uh, h to p where h is the mess size and p is the polynomial order. And this is the, the main result in, in our work with with Eric, Ali, and Arnold. And, and the rest of the talk will make this uh, statement more precise. Right, so what I mean by, by, by this uh, mess size and, and polynomial order, I will just show this in pictures. But let me now emphasize that this phi age is something that we can really compute by solving some finite dimensional linear system. So this gives a constructive method to, uh, to solve, solve the control problem. So, uh, 
So finite elements in, in pictures. So let's just do this in, in 1D and consider the unit interval. And we discretize the unit interval by, by choosing some grid there, consisting of n capital N plus one points. Then what is called the mesh size is simply the maximum distance between two consecutive points. So if this is part of the of the grid here, maybe this could be then age. And um, and then the polynomial order looks like this. So here I have sketched uh, two uh, basis functions in the case of polynomial order one that intersect this, or who support intersect this uh, middle grid cell here. And here I have done the same for polynomial order two. So we have more sort of richer basis here. We use also piecewise uh, uh, functions that are piecewise of polynomial order two. And uh, you can think that this is sort of a zoom of this, of this picture on the left, where this uh, triangular functions don't show up completely. And only this new, new, new uh, second order polynomial shows up completely. Okay. And if you think about this approximation of functions using this type of uh, piecewise polynomial basis, in, in one day it's fairly easy to understand what happens. Um, so for instance, if I have a smooth compactly supported function in one day, and I want to approximate it in a finite element basis, uh, then the best possible approximation, or let's say a good approximation, uh, will converge to this uh, smooth function with the rate uh, h to p plus one. So the mesh size to power of polynomial order plus one, which is fairly easy to understand if you look at this sketch. So here we have a uniform grid, our a's is just uh, of this size here between two uh, consecutive grid points. So if we approximate this blue function, which is now our u, with this red function, which is u h, um, it's easy to understand that this error that you make here, that this is of order h squared. So in this case, we have this polynomial order one. And also you see that this is really the best possible possible uh, error that you can get. So uh, in our in this convergence estimate that we prove, we get a convergence rate uh, h to p, which is then uh, suboptimal of at most one degree. If you compare it to this uh, sort of best possible approximation where you really just have complete inform, which you can do if you have complete information of this u, but here we of course solve some control problem and don't have this uh, function that we approximate at hand to begin with, which explains why we lose this one uh, order possibly. Uh, well, of course, we don't know if this is optimal. Maybe this rate is actually optimal for the control problem, but at least it's not suboptimal uh, of, of too much. Okay, so this is a, sort of a very quick summary of uh, finite element approximations. Now, um, let's let's have a look at the, the previous literature on uh, on numerical analysis of, of this type of control problems. It has been known for a long time that uh, these are not that easy problems to solve computationally. So if you do some naive discretizations of the control problem, they may fail to, they may fail to converge due to uh, spurious high frequency modes. And this was observed by, by Klovinsky and his co-authors in a series of works in the 90s. And here I'm just referring to a very nice review paper in Acta Numerica by Glovinsky and Lyons. So for me, this was a very good place to start uh, learning about this, uh, this sort of early, early history of the topic. And after this observation, there have been two uh, approaches to, to remedy these this problems or, or solve these problems. And uh, first of these is, is that you, you can try to recreate the control theory that you have in, 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 in some Sobolov spaces, let's say, uh, on some uh, discrete spaces given by, let's say, a finite element approximation. And 
you need to do some uh, filtering of high frequencies because of these spurious high frequency modes. Um, and there have been uh, theoretical work on, on, on uniform meshes where you can, in fact, uh, develop this control theory in the, in the sort of, in a sense, I guess, directly on the, on the discrete level. Uh, and to my knowledge, the first work of this kind is by Infante and Zuazua from 99. And there, there are lots and lots of works. I cannot uh, review them all here. Uh, and there is another way to, to get discrete control theory. Namely, you can somehow derive the uh, derived discrete version of control theory from this usual continuum theory by using some spectral type uh, estimates. And uh, this is a uh, result by, by Sylvain. And also, uh, it, it, I think it, uh, this result by Sylvain relies on some uh, work of, of Miller. And then Miller also had a look at this problem by himself. The problem with this approach is that it uh, it loses track of this uh, time capital in my notation capital T that was needed for the for the control. So you don't get the same uh, control time as you you have for the continuum theory. And we know that the continuum theory is is essentially sharp. So this geometric control condition really characterizes the the ca cases when you actually have a solution to this problem, this control problem. Uh, now, this other approach is to uh, formulate some sort of iterative method in the, uh, for, the, for the continuous problem before discretizing it, and then just discretize this uh, iteration. And there have been at least two different uh, approaches based on different formulations in the continuum. So there is one by Sindem, Nikon, Tuxnak, and one by uh, Silvain, Hervedeosa, and, and Zuazua. Um, now, the problem with the second approach is that uh, when you discretize an iteration, you pick up some uh, discretization error at each step, and this error can accumulate, and the iteration can actually start to diverge. And in fact, here I'm referring to, to a very nice monograph by Hervedeus and Zuazua, where they actually show that this type of methods typically do diverge. And this means that if you use iterative method, you have to have some sort of stopping criteria for the iteration, and these are not that easy to design. In fact, uh, these type of problems are, are uh, discussed as open problems in this, in this monograph. So after this, uh, there have been some ideas of formulating these uh, control problems in a, in a more direct way in the continuum and then discretize this, these uh, direct formulations. And uh, I will explain what this means in detail because our method is of this nature. But let me just mention that the first method of this kind is by, by Sinde and Munch, which is of course one of the authors of this present work as well. Um, so they they designed a method and they showed that it converges very nicely in, in numerical experiments and they also analyzed the convergence but the proof is not quite uh, closed so there is some uh, assumption on certain quantities that appear in the proof um, and this the formulation is is based on using finite element basis in, in, in space and time simultaneously. So what is called space-time finite elements. And this is also uh, the approach that, that the present work takes. So, so I will explain this in detail a bit later. Uh, so what we do in this work is, is also, as I said, space-time finite element method. We prove convergence, as I already indicated. And I mentioned that we also have an earlier work with, uh, with Eric and Ali of, of sort of similar nature which is not using space-time elements, but instead it's using uh, affine, mm, this was affine finite elements in space and finite differences in time. Uh, but this work is somehow conceptually much, mm, or it's, it's, it's more technical and also yeah, somehow on the conceptual level more difficult than uh, the space-time formulation, which is uh, actually quite slick as I, uh, I will try to, to explain. So this is maybe, some sort of uh, narrative how to how we ended up 
into this uh, type of methods. And maybe this is indeed how, how Arnold uh, ended up uh, doing this method. Mm. But we, the rest three of us, we actually approach this problem from a completely different angle. Uh, we, were, we had developed some um, numerical analysis to the dual problem for the control problem. And let me now uh, remind you of, of this uh, dual problem. So, uh, so the dual problem is, is, is an inverse problem and, and my background is really in inverse problems. But this duality is nothing else but the usual duality that you, you see in, in, the, in these uh, proofs that show that um, observability estimate implies that the control problem has a solution. But let me just quickly still recall it. So I define a map A where I solve this initial value problem for the wave equation and then just restrict it on the, the, the uh, let's say on some sort of observation domain again given by some by this small case omega. And then the transpose of this map A is also associated to a solution to the wave equation. So now we have a source on the on the right hand side. We solve this equation and then evaluate, starting from this zero uh, final condition, and then evaluate uh, the solution at the initial time. And here, f must be supported in the same region where uh, you observe uh, in this a. So then, of course, observability estimate is saying that this map a is injective con in a continuous fashion, and then. Uh, a simple functional analytical argument says that um, the dual is surjective. And this is of course why this observability estimate implies that you have a solution to the control problem because surjectivity then means that there is f driving um, the state to do to whatever you want. Um, so why I want to write this in this sort of in this detail is because I want to emphasize that this this problem here, this injectivity of A is, is what we would call inverse initial source problem. So, or let's say inversion of A is what we would call inverse initial source problem. So we, we think that we don't know the, the initial data. We have instead this observation and we want to recover the initial data. And this uh, observability of uh, estimate, of course, then shows that this inverse initial source problem has a solution and it's also stable. So, so this is just a, a formulation of this inverse initial source problem. So we want to find the initial data given this observation for the solution to the wave equation. And instead of thinking that we recover this initial uh, data, we can just think that we recover phi everywhere. Because of course, if you know the initial data, then you know phi everywhere. So another formulation that is more of unique continuation flavor is that given this phi in this thin cylinder, find phi in this larger domain. Um, so we have been studying numerical analysis for problems of this form. So you want to continue a solution to PD from a small set to a large set. And, and the, basically we have covered, let's say the group at UCL where has covered um, the elliptic parabolic and the hyperbolic cases for these unique continuation problems. Uh, starting from this elliptic Cauchy problem uh, by Eric and then we did with Eric and Jonathan Ishorovich, uh, the parabolic case, and then with uh, Eric, Ali, and Arnold, uh, the hyperbolic case. And this is, of course, uh, strongly related to, to Mihai uh, Nikita's talk, who, who is also or was part of this group at UCL. So last week in this seminar, he uh, talked about these unique continuation problems for uh, Helmholtz equation and for con convection diffusion equations. So also he's using uh, similar, similar techniques as I'm going to discuss today. And in his case, he was interested in you know, quantifying the, the estimates um, 
explicitly in terms of physical parameters in the problem, which is something that I'm not going to focus on today. Okay. So now I need to recall some uh, some uh, results for the continuum problem, for this continuum control problem. And in fact, our whole uh, finite element method is, is building on this result by Hervé Dos and Zuazua that says that a certain minimal norm solution to the control problem is smooth if the data is smooth and compactly supported. In fact, uh, you can have a more technical formulation with some limited sub smoothness, but then you need to discuss also the, if you want to have a sharp result, then you need to discuss also compatibility conditions. And I don't want to enter into that. So let me just for simplicity, assume that everything, uh, that the data is, is smooth and compactly supported. So the theorem is, if uh, the geometric control condition is satisfied in this uh, sense of this smooth cutoff function chi that I described earlier, and if the initial data is smooth, then there is a smooth control to the control problem. So smooth control driving the solution of the wave equation from this initial data to zero. And the control satisfies additionally this wave equation where the initial data is characterized by being the unique minimizer over this space to this functional J. So um, yeah, we are just going to use this result uh, as a starting point for our uh, finite element method. And for this result, you need this technical condition on, on, on this cutoff function chi that it vanishes near the initial and end times. So this is where this uh, technical condition comes from. I mean, the, the, somehow the reason behind this is that the way that you derive this smoothness somehow morally is that you want to show that if you differentiate in time, then these time derivatives of u and phi also satisfy uh, wave equations and then somehow uh, start building up the smoothness. And, and this trick then requires somehow the, that you are able to differentiate nicely also near the initial and end times, which then uh, explains this smooth cutoff near that, those times. Okay. But we are not going to, I mean, use somehow the full uh, formulation of this problem. Instead, we are going to just somehow throw away this additional piece of information about the uh, initial conditions. So we are just going to look at this system where we, we look at the, the constraints coming from the control problem. So U is a solution to the wave equation with this control on the right hand side, it has zero boundary condition uh, and it starts from this uh, prescribed initial state and reaches the zero end state. And then the control satisfies the wave equation. So here this box is just the wave, wave operator uh, with zero boundary condition. I just forget this. I choose to forget that I also knew something about the initial conditions of phi. I just throw this piece of information away. But uh, this result anyway then implies that there is a smooth solution to this problem, assuming again, of course, GCC and uh, a smooth compactly supported initial data. And then it's easy to see that in fact, this system here must have a unique solution. And here is the proof. So let's consider two solutions. U1, phi1, U2, phi2. And Look at, let's look at the difference. Let's call these differences phi and uh, u. Then it's easy to see that these differences satisfy the same system, but with zeros here as, as initial data. And then we can uh, compute uh, this um, inner product here. So we just take basically the L2 inner product of, or L2 norm of phi, but localized with this cutoff function chi. We use the, this first equation here in this first, first equality, just substitute for this chi phi, box u, and then we integrate by parts. And now we have 
so many vanishing uh, boundary conditions and initial and final initial and final conditions that there, there are no boundary terms when you do the integration by parts so you move move box to the other side but phi satisfies box so this is zero so this means that now phi must vanish in the support of chi but we assume that the support of chi contains a region that satisfies the geometric control condition so uh, this equation together with chi vanishing in the support of uh, phi vanishing in the support of chi then implies that phi must vanish everywhere because of the observability estimate and when once phi vanishes then you must vanish as well from this equation and that's it so our finite element method is actually going to be based on this rather funny looking system so we want to want to somehow uh, discretize this system and to do that using finite element methods method uh, what we first do is we we write this system uh, in a weak way so let's have a let's let's look at the weak formulation of this control problem so i will use this notation g is the the minkowski metric in the in, in, in one in this in this uh, in this space of, of dimension one plus n so which just means that it is given by this diagonal matrix where we have minus one at top left corner and then all the rest of the diagonal elements are one and then of diagonal elements are zero and then we define a bilinear form so I'm gonna take the Minkowski in a product of the space-time differential of of uh, our two input functions u and v and then we have some boundary terms and this normal derivative here is is a bit funny normal derivative so it, this new vector is actually the uh, euclidean outward pointing unit normal vector but the first component that corresponds to this time variable is flipped this, the sign of, of that first component is flipped so this is the definition of this normal vector here okay so we have some uh, some boundary terms here you see this is almost symmetric except that in this first boundary terms we take the, the boundary of the whole space-time cylinder so m denotes the whole space-time cylinder whereas in the second boundary terms we look at only the lateral part of the boundary but this was the most symmetric formulation that we could find. I defined a linear form that simply pairs V with the initial values of, or this with this um, given initial data, U1 and U, U0. And then I also uh, have this um, bilinear form C, which contains this cutoff function chi. Now it's uh, fairly easy to see it's an exercise in integrations by part um, to see that if we have now this system that I had in the previous slide which has uh, argued that if you solve this system you get a, a solution to the control problem um, so if, if, if u phi is a solution to this system then uh, it also satisfies for all let's say smooth enough test functions psi and v without any support uh, without any boundary conditions assumed um, that uh, this a form is the same uh, equals to c form plus l uh, for u and a form for phi in the other slot uh, equals zero and this also the, the opposite implication is true so this is really the weak formulation of this uh, complicated system right so now i can i can uh, give the the formulation of the of the finite element method uh, this weak formulation or these objects in the fig formulation this this bilinear forms and the linear form uh, appear here in the in this uh, finite element method formulation but uh, let, let's let's uh, start from the beginning so first i need to define the spaces so this th is a quasi-uniform family of, of triangulations of the space-time domain so if, if this is 2d then these are really uh, sort of 
you divide the, the domain in small triangles. And if it's higher dimensional, you divide the, the domain in small uh, simplices. There is some technical uh, thing here that I'm going to sweep under the rug. Uh, how relating to the discretization of the boundary of this spatial domain. Here, uh, age is the mesh size of this, this uh, of this triangulation, so it means the, the diameter of these triangles appearing. And then by P, P over K, I denote the space of polynomials of degree less or equal to P on some set in this uh, in this one, one plus n dimensional space. And then I define my finite element space. So this is the space of all continuous functions such that they are piecewise polynomials of order P on each of these triangles. Um, okay, so then still a bit more notation before I can formulate my finite element method. So I'm going to systematically use capital letters when I want to somehow collect the, the state of the wave equation. So the, for instance, U, capital U naught is the uh, is this uh, pair that contains the whole initial data that is given. This is somehow the input parameter to the problem, right? And then I measure the, the size of this type of pair using a sort of energy norm, where I have L2 norm of the first uh, somehow corresponding to the state and and uh, then L2 norm of the what corresponds to the time derivative also. But you see that these are scaled very differently. So somehow morally, uh, let's say on the discrete level, this roughly corresponds then to H1 norm scaled by H. So this is somehow on the risk discrete level, this really corresponds to the natural energy to the wave equation scaled by H. Then uh, I'm almost ready to formulate the, the finite element method. So it, it has this form. We want to find, we compute the critical point of this Lagrangian functional defined on, the, on, uh, on this discrete uh, space, where we can use different polynomial orders for these variables u and phi. And the Lagrangian is of, of this form. We say that the energy of this u variable the energy of the of the initial state of this u variable uh, must be close to this given initial state that is the data for the problem so this is somehow the the in a, if you use the main minimization term then we have some sort of penalty term which i call the stabilization i'm going to give it in the next slide and then i have this uh, uh, sort of weak formulation of this system that I, I described in the previous slide. So roughly speaking, this, this Lagrangian tries to say, minimize this energy difference under this PD constraint uh, and some uh, additional penalty. So um, let's have a look at this additional, additional penalty. This is really the, the, the core of the method. And I guess, I mean, this is probably related to the filtering of high frequencies that uh, I already mentioned in this, uh, in this context of previous results. And that was also discussed last time after Mihai's talk, but um, we haven't really made a formal connection, but, but heuristically, this is some sort of implementing some sort of high frequency filtering. So uh, first of all, a little bit more notation, um, we've write for write uh, f h for the set of internal phases of this triangulation and then we use this uh, bracket notation for uh, for the jump of some quantity over over an internal phase in the triangulation and then the the stabilization this quadratic form giving the stabilization is is given by this so we sum over all the triangles uh, this type of norms that that contain the wave operator, both for uh, for this u and phi variables. Then for both u and phi variables, we also penalize uh, using this type of bilinear form, where now we have these uh, jumps appearing. In a sense, 
this is maybe the most important term in this stabilization. This is really the magical term to me. Uh, so what we do here is that we penalize the jumps of these normal derivatives across internal phases. And everything here is somehow scaled in a, in a delicate fashion with some powers of the mesh constant. So there is also then these sort of uh, terms that penalize the, the value on the lateral boundary. And then we also penalize the final time energy of the of this u variable. So what is important here is that uh, if we have a solution to this system that I described earlier, then if you plug in this, this solution to this quadratic form q, you actually just get zero. You see that all these terms are chosen so that for a solution to this system, they just vanish. Uh, let me emphasize for a smooth solution because this term here vanishes for smooth solution. So this is somehow uh, imposing some sort of smoothness. And maybe this is somehow the term that is responsible for most of this high frequency filtering. Okay, so now I actually have described all the building blocks of this method and I can, I can give the, uh, the precise uh, result that we have with Eric, Ali and Arnold. So suppose that the geometric control condition holds and we fix some uh, polynomial orders P and Q, they most, both must be uh, greater than one. And then supposing that the, solu the unique solution to this system encoding the control problem is smooth enough, uh, then this discrete Lagrangian has a unique critical point in this finite element space. And this phi variable of the critical point converges to, this, to the continuum solution with this uh, rate. And this smoothness assumption can be also formulated in terms of this uh, initial, initial data, but then you need to discuss the, the compatibility conditions and so on. So let me not enter into that. Moreover, and this Lagrangian is quadratic, so if you compute the critical points, you are just led to the uh, linear system. The linear system is imposed on a finite dimensional space, so, so it's just a matrix system, and you can implement uh, a computer program to solve it. And in fact, you can do this in practice, although uh, this work is still somewhat in progress, and I cannot show you uh, numerical results for this problem yet. But we solved uh, sort of the analogous dual problem earlier with Eric, Ali, and Arnold using a similar method based on similar sort of stabilization ideas. And in that case, we have numerical uh, results. So just, let me just show you numerical results uh, for this inverse source problem, the dual problem. So we get this very nice uh, convergence for different choices of polynomial orders. And they are completely in line with the theory, which is slightly different in that uh, for that inverse problem. In fact, uh, for the inverse problem, you can just always choose uh, uh, sort of the dual variable to to be of order, uh, to be approximated by first order polynomials, and you still get very good rates. In fact, we get for at least for p two and for p three for this particular numerical uh, example, we actually get this optimal rate that is a bit better than what we can prove. So also in this inverse source problem in case, we prove this estimate with only h to p. OK, so, um, so as I said, somehow the most magical part of the stabilization is this term here, or this, this sum here. And this is not our invention. It has been used for a long time in the context of uh, finite element methods. Uh, it was first used for uh, convection diffusion uh, equations where convection uh, dominates diffusion. So uh, so if you think that this, this problem comes with uh, some uh, zero boundary condition on some uh, on the boundary of some domain, this boundary condition makes sense if you have really diffusion. But when, when epsilon goes to zero, this becomes transport equation. And then there are sort of influx uh, or sort of, I would say, 
where there is some sort of transport throughout the domain, right? And there is sort of part where the, the data comes in and the, the part where you go out. Some, there, there is some technical name for this, but I don't remember it now. Um, and simply cannot uh, describe, uh, prescribe the, some sort of uh, uh, boundary conditions throughout. Uh, and and uh, when this epsilon is small, you typically get this sort of very sharp boundary layers, which are hard to resolve numerically. And to do these things numerically uh, in a in a stable way, this sort of type of uh, stabilization was was introduced by Douglas and Dupont. But it wasn't used, I guess, too much uh, because some other ideas took over. But then Eric uh, Burman and Hasbu they they analyzed uh, this again. And then there is a series of work that leads to the to, to, to present work. So this is somehow one other historical context for, for this work. And this type of ideas have been used for different equations, including, for instance, the Stokes problem. OK. So let's see. So maybe I can still say just a little bit about the proof. I have still a couple of minutes left, as far as I understand. So. Um, and I'm going to say something about the proof, but only for this case of polynomial order one, just because it is notationally a bit simpler. So in this case, we can just uh, rewrite the Lagrangian because all these um, terms involving the wave operator are simply zero. They were defined on, on each element and on each element, uh, these u and phi are just uh, affine functions. So if you hit them with second order derivatives, they will just vanish. So those terms are actually not present. And then I, I have thrown away one other, other term to simplify things because it's not needed in this case. It's completely dominated by the C term here. Um, now, if I write uh, the equation for critical points of this Lagrangian on this uh, finite element space, uh, well, I just differentiate. So let's see if I differentiate in U, to the direction of v, for instance, this term I get this suv, and from this term I get a v phi, and so on. And then from this energy, I get this is quadratic form, I get the corresponding bilinear form that I called small case e. Coming from here and here, I get two of them, and, uh, and so on. So it's easy to see that the, the critical points can be written in, in this fashion. So you have some test functions for v and psi, and uh, these equations must hold for all these test functions. And I can also uh, now write this in a, in a shorter form by just summing these two equations together. And I do that. And then I move all uh, quadratic terms to left, all linear terms to right. And then this defines a bilinear form that I call A. Now, I. What I want to now explain about the proof is that this discrete system has a, a unique solution. So there is a unique solution for this equation here. And why is that? Well, if you think about this system, it's just a linear system for uh, in, in a finite dimensional space. So it's a matrix system. If you think about the number of uh, unknowns, it's the number of degrees of freedom in u and phi. And the number of equations is then given by the number of degrees of freedom in these test functions. And this u phi and v psi are in the same space. So there are equally many degrees of freedom as there are equations. So this is, in other words, a square system of linear equations. So for a square system, then of course, existence is equivalent uh, to uniqueness in the finite dimensional case as here. So what we really need to show is that uh, if I put right hand side zero, then the zero solution is the only uh, solution. So, so let's assume that the right hand side is zero and let's compute. So recall that this uh, bilinear form A is given by these expressions. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to plug in a test function that is of this form. So, um, so I just take u and negative of phi. And you see, with this choice, these two last terms will cancel out. And this, by the way, explains why we have uh, this sort of, why in these regularization terms, we sometimes have plus and sometimes have minus in front of the terms, because now with this choice, we get only positive terms. 
from this first line here. And we collect this, I mean, uh, collect these positive terms together and say that they, they define a norm that we call triple norm. And this, well, what we really need to show in order to show that this system has a unique solution, we need to show that this triple norm is actually a norm. And that follows because, well, all these terms are positive, they must be separately zero. This term here, you recall, is nothing else but chi phi squared integrated in space time. So phi must vanish in the support of chi. This term here contains these jumps. So all jumps must be zero. Also, this term contains the boundary value. So also the boundary value must be zero. So phi must be zero in, in this uh, observation region and also on the boundary. And now, because phi is also piecewise affine function, it satisfies the wave equation in each of these triangles separately. And because of this jump being zero and phi being a continuous function, then it actually satisfies the, the wave equation in the whole space-time domain. But phi satisfies now uh, wave equation in the whole space-time domain, it has zero boundary condition. And it also vanishes here in the support of chi. So we can just use observability estimate. This is a subspace of H1, so that is allowed. Uh, to see that phi is zero everywhere. And a similar argument starting from this initial data rather than this uh, observation region data shows that also u is zero. So this is how we see that this uh, system has a unique solution. So now I'm, I'm running out of time. Uh, the, the convergence proof is that I sketch here is just like two slides, but unfortunately I don't have time to, to do it. But I just want to say that this is, um, this is not uh, too complicated, this proof. Uh, I guess the only sort of complicated bit of this work was to find the right formulation, the right Lagrangian. Uh, but after you know what, what to choose, to understand the proof is actually not that, um, not that difficult. Uh, and and uh, once again, this is, the, this is the result. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Lovie. So I'm sure everyone uh, joins me in the applause. Um, uh, is there any question? So if there is, please feel free to open the microphone and, and ask. Can I ask a question, please? Yes, Yava, please. OK, so uh, Lori, did you try to apply your results? Sorry to take it to the inverse problem, but for me, it's uh, quite natural to think about inverse problem with this kind of result. Did you try to consider the reconstruction result for inverse problem, like the, the acoustic inversion for multi-wave problem, which correspond to, so you didn't consider boundary control, uh, internal control, consisting in, but if you push it to boundary to recover boundary measurement, the initial pressure, you, you have yes. kind of things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, Basically, this numerics that I showed you is exactly this this problem where you want to okay. recover the initial initial state, given some data on 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 a subdomain. Um, let me think. I mean, we can, as I said, we can do these things on the boundary, but uh, the results are a bit more messy, and I don't think that we get. Uh, I mean, it seems that we lose some uh, order of convergence there, at, at least at the moment. This is this is what we get. I'm, I'm, so, but, but I think these type of methods can be pushed also to these questions where you have data on the boundary, which is of course maybe the really the the most usual formulation, and maybe at least from the point of view of inverse problems, the, the physical formulation as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other question? So, during the meantime, I have one. Uh, so here, I, I wonder at the end. So in on the numerical uh, level at fixed h, mm -hmm. the control you are computing 
what does it give on the on the data? Does it give that the, your your state is controlled at zero at time capital T, or is it small in some norm, or what do you have on it? Uh, so yeah, uh, um, so yeah, when you do, somehow don't consider the asymptotic result, but you are asking if it's uh, what uh, well. I mean, it's, well, it satisfies this this equation, which is of course very messy, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, one one answer to the question is that I mean, this A is still somehow encoding the wave equation, right? So it satisfies some wave equation with you know some sort of perturbation on the right hand side uh, coming from these uh, sort of destabilization terms, uh, and and the same is. Uh, well, I mean, this is the wave equation for phi. This is the wave equation for u, right? Mm. And also, yeah, also we can, I mean, as a byproduct of the proof, we show that uh, these, um, well, first of all, we show, for instance, that this triple norm converges. So all, all the, uh, these bits coming from the, from the stabilization, they converge to zero. So you have, you're sort of perturbing the wave equation but the perturbation then asymptotically goes to zero. Um, yeah, maybe this could be sort of studied even even further, but um, but yeah, I mean, if you if you solve a, a wave equation in the discrete level, right? I mean, I mean, you, you never really solve the continuum wave equation anyway, right? You solve some sort yes. of discrete mm -hmm. projection, right? That holds in the sense that you test against only discrete functions, right? So of course there is this aspect as well, and and I guess I mean looking at from that that point of view, I mean we are just you know perturbing now the the discrete wave equation, but I guess we are not perturbing the sort of the continuum wave equation much more than what you would perturb it anyway by choosing some discretization. That is some I guess one one way to look at this. Yeah. Okay. But at at the end, your states u h at time capital T, this is something of order of H or H uh, of oh, yeah, T, or is this it is zero what exactly? Yes, uh, let's let's see. So we know that this this energy at capital T is going to converge to zero with some rate, right? Mm -hmm. And then this is, if we recall what is this H, uh, well, it is like the, it is like the, so the, some sort of discrete energy, as I said, is it like H1, L2, the typical energy, uh, but it's scaled with uh, with H. I mean, after you take the square roots, it's actually scaled by H to one half. And then if you sort of combine this with the, with the convergence estimate, you will see that this, this energy, I mean, without H goes to zero with rate where you, I guess, lose one half, uh, one half, uh, so h to one half, compared to this hp that we have in the for for the control, right? Be because of this h in front of the the norm. So so yeah, I mean, again, I mean, this is uh, everything that I say is sort of something related to the asymptotic behavior, right? Yeah, sure. But but somehow, yeah. So. So, I mean, the, the final state will be small. Mm. Okay. Uh, thank you. Is there any other question? Well, okay. If not, well, I will thank you. Thank you again for your very nice talk. And thank you all for, for attending. So next talk next week, next Thursday. Well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you.